Sarah, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Russ. You just about made the countdown then. I know. I know. I, it, I It's a test. It's usually it's like your favorite a, bit. It is. It's like if I was a DJ, <laughs> if I was a DJ, I would like, I, I would like to just risk me talking over the lyrics of a song, you know? Uh, yeah. I like to just take the challenge and see, can I, can I get out of screen and in screen in time to make it? So, um, but it's great to see you again. Great to see you, Russ, as always. I, I, I know we've, ju- we've, we've done a few more recordings recently, so I still miss you, but not as much because I've seen yes. you a little bit more often than, <laughs> than the last time we spoke. So, uh, but it is great to see you. So uh, I'm, I'm sensing that it's, it's warm where you are. Yes. Are you having because I can sun. see you're smiling and you're yeah but when, whenever the sun's out Sarah smiles um and so uh, and how is it so when the sun is out for you today like what are the things you're doing today what what's the thing you're going to have on your list or what did you do today yeah the day's over for me Russ because I'm it's kind of getting on for evening here but I've been to the beach I mean I'm live I'm on the south coast of England so you know as soon as the sun comes out that's it yeah it's the beach time so it's been fabulous. Well, that's great. Um, my, I have a gloomy day here, but it's been hot. But I am in sunlight. I feel great. Our guest is here, and our guest is seems to be, uh, you know, in a in a vehicle that she can move around as well. But I, who who's our guest today? So I want to introduce Kayla. I mean, we're very lucky to have Kayla on the show, and I'm super excited because she is one of the leading experts in this field of female biohacking. And, and it's such a cool subject and it's something that I think is really only recently starting to be addressed and there's not many people who are truly experts in this field. So, hi, Kayla, thank you so much for coming on. I'd say I, I really am super keen to talk to you because, you know, out of all the things that I've listened to and I've been to a lot of the events now, now things are open, I can actually get to events. And really some of your talks have been Certainly for me, the most educational, because in biohacking, you know, sometimes you hear the same thing over again. But a lot of this stuff about female female biohacking or even, you know, just female physiology, we don't have to call it biohacking and how that relates to performance and everything else that we do. It's something that's relatively new. So it's lovely to see you again and so fabulous that we're seeing you from your RV. Um, And great, great that you came on. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited for this discussion. I know we connected at an event, gosh, months, months back, and we've been planning to do this. So I'm really happy that we caught each other and we're able to do this now. Yeah, it's super cool. I mean, I know, Russ, I I was almost going to steal your question then, Russ, but you go ahead and do your... Yeah, I mean, I, I come at these things not knowing any of Sarah's friends, and hopefully by the end of the podcast we're somewhat chummy, not, I don't need to be texting you, you know, like not that kind of friend, Um, but (laughs) at least you recognize me and be like, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, But what is your superpower? What is your biohacking superpower, Kayla? Ooh, my biohacking superpower is actually the same as all women, but very little known, which is my female biological rhythm. Wow. And how, so let's go through that and, and yeah. I'm going to be envious that I don't have a female biorhythm here. So like, 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 what does that mean? Yes. So I'll just give a little overview of the difference between the male biological rhythm, which we all know very well, um, which is the basis for all of our health systems and our infrastructures in society and even our business culture and schedules and all of these things um, are all based around the male biology and the male biological rhythm. And there's a good reason for that. It's because our scientific research has primarily been only done on male bodies. Um, women have actually been left out of the scientific research for decades now. Um, Back in 1977, when the FDA formally banned all of us from clinical research, which remained in effect until 93. And unfortunately, even today, women are still not studied. They're not equally included in the research. And there's a huge gap in the scientific understanding of feminine biology and exactly how it works. And so that's what I've dedicated my research and my career on uncovering, understanding, and building the evidence base for feminine biology and bringing that into our culture, into our infrastructures, and especially to educate women on biohacking. 
So the male biological rhythm is this 24 hour repeating system. And this is driven by a couple of key hormones, which is cortisol and melatonin. And cortisol and melatonin are sleep wake hormones, right? That align with our circadian rhythm. And both men and women have a circadian rhythm, but the big difference is that the male circadian rhythm is actually at the heartbeat, it's at the center of the global male physiology, meaning that a man's biology actually operates on this clock-like system of 24 hours. Now with women, our biological rhythm or this biological pace that sets the rhythm of our physiology is um, is set to two other key hormones, which are estrogen and progesterone. These are our ovarian hormones, and these two hormones act very differently than this 24-hour repeating system. They actually act on a month-long rhythm, about 28 days. Every woman's a little different. But what happens is estrogen and progesterone ebb and flow over the course of these 28 days and actually significantly shift our physiology, our neurology, our biochemistry, so much so that women are actually four different people over the course of a month. And so why this is so key, because we have these four different versions of us every month, biochemically, physiologically, neurologically, women actually have to really understand these four phases and the differences that occur across the month so that they can make the right biohacking and health choices for each of the four phases. So essentially, because we're these four different people as women over the course of a month, we need four different sets of biohacking routines. And so that's the secret sauce. And that's my superpower and every other woman's superpower. It's totally cool and totally mind blowing because obviously this is not something that we've been taught, you know, all through school, all through education, all through doing any kind of sports or any kind of training. And and that's why I think it's so important to talk about it because it has an impact, presumably not only on athletic performance, but also on work performance, on relationships, really on everything. So I'm keen to see, I'm keen to hear how you break down these four like you say, four people that, that, that women are. Yeah, so let's go quickly through the four phases, and then we can even, after that, maybe talk about some biohacks that are good for each phase. Um, so phase one is the menstrual phase, and this is typically the only one that we're taught about as women. We, we know that we're on our period or we're not on our period, right? We don't get educated about all four phases of the menstrual cycle, and we certainly don't get educated that these biochemical signatures of these four phases of the menstrual cycle actually have a global physiological impact. And so there's a global physiological signature of each four phase as well. And that's what I'm calling the female biorhythm or the biological rhythm. So phase one, again, is the menstrual phase. This is actually marked by the lowest amount of these two key hormones, estrogen and progesterone. So they are at their very lowest level of the whole month. And this phase lasts about a week, five days to seven days. Every woman's a little different, like I said. Um, and then in this phase, when estrogen and progesterone are at their lowest level, this has an interesting impact on our metabolism. So our metabolism actually slows down and our metabolic function slows down. So when we're looking at what goes on biochemically in our body, the processes start to slow down. And so we actually produce and generate less ATP. So we have lower energy levels naturally, and we produce less of our mood boosting and excitatory neurotransmitters. So we're talking about serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all of these things that give us a lot of energy and focus and also increase our mood. So in phase one, we have lower mood, lower energy, which kind of sounds like a bummer, but what I love about this is that women actually have these cognitive strengths during each of the four phases, which I call their cognitive superpowers. And it's kind of like this extra sensory um, ability that the other half of the population doesn't have. <laughs> and so for women in phase one, when we look at how our brain is functioning and how things are shifting, which by the way, is because we actually have high densities of receptors for estrogen and progesterone in key areas of our brain that modulate its function. So in phase one, we actually see that women have heightened what the scientific community is calling cognitive empathy. 
Now, this is a fancy scientific term for intuition. So in phase one, women have heightened intuitive insight. So they have a greater ability to kind of make decisions, to um, allocate resources and planning and things like that. Going into phase two, it's the follicular phase. And this is marked by a steady rise to a peak in estrogen. So one of our key hormones takes the stage and becomes the star of the show for the follicular phase. And as that happens, our, meta our metabolic function increases. So we generate more ATP. We also generate more of those mood boosting and excitatory neurotransmitters. So our energy levels increase, our mood increases or stabilizes, um, and our endurance, our strength, our power, our stamina, all of these things increase. When we look at what's going on with the brain during this phase, we actually see that we have heightened navigational ability and we have heightened emotional intelligence. So our emotional intelligence increases through this phase. So if you kind of think about it functionally, this is a great time for leadership. This is a great time to be interacting with others because we have this heightened emotional intelligence. We have higher energy. We have more stamina, endurance, and even physically, um, we have more strength and power, things like that. So going from that phase into phase three, this is what I actually call the bloom phase, but this is the ovulatory phase. Um, and this is actually more of a phase shift than a phase in and of itself. But it is important to parse it out because there are specific, like I said, superpowers that we definitely want to leverage in this phase as well. So in this phase, it's marked by a peak of estrogen, but also a peak of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So when this happens, we have all these juicy hormones running around in our body. We get this heightened metabolic act or the highest metabolic activity. We have the highest energy levels, the highest mood. We're feeling socially um, very capable. We are feeling outwardly expressive and we're feeling very sharp um, cognitively as well because we have all of those excitatory neurotransmitters really pumping. Uh, and so our cognitive superpower during this phase is charismatic influence. So we're more influential. We have this charismatic quality to us. And this is when we want to be doing our pitches. This is when we want to be doing our presentations or doing our networking, things like this. Going from that phase into the last and final phase, which is the luteal phase, I actually call this the grow phase because this is when our capacity to grow as a human, but also our capacity for our brain to grow is heightened. Um, so this is actually my favorite phase because I call it the brainy phase because uh, some really cool things happen to our brain. So estrogen starts to take a back seat on the stage. And during this phase, progesterone takes a front seat. And now this phase is long. It's about two weeks. So it's basically the whole back half, whereas the first three phases are the whole first half. And during this phase in, into the middle, this is when progesterone peaks and estrogen is kind of falling down the other side. There's a little bit of a, a small boost in the middle, but progesterone is the key player. Now, as progesterone increases, we also see some cool things, like I said, happening with the brain, one of which is we get increased brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, and when this happens, we get a couple of awesome things that really happen for our brain that heighten our ability to learn and to um, kind of adapt to our environments, and that is we get increased neuroplasticity which is the moldability of our brain, right? The neural pathways. And we also get increased neurogenesis. So not only is our brain more moldable and we're more adaptable to new behaviors, but we actually grow new neurons at a heightened rate during this phase, which is pretty cool. The other cool neurological thing that happens is that we get increased GABA neurotransmitter, and so GABA neurotransmitter is involved in getting restful sleep and also the ability to stay asleep. It's involved in neural pruning and memory consolidation. So we get this heightened ability to learn and consolidate new memories during this phase because of all the cool neurological things that are going on. And our cognitive superpower during this phase is acuity because we have this heightened mental and verbal acuity during this phase. Men are so boring. We're just like... <laughs> I mean, we have a we have a twenty four hour cycle. I mean, really, like, I, I I find I find that I this is where I'm envious. I wish I were a woman so I could have four weeks of just change and blossoming, and it's amazing. 
it is amazing. I love the female biology. It's my favorite thing. It's so beautiful and complex. And the male biology is just as beautiful and complex. It's just that we already know yeah. mostly everything there is to know about it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just uncovering new things about women. So it's very exciting. It's very cool. I mean, is this something that you kind of track yourself or you've kind of learned to as you've kind of made all these discoveries to track these different phases? Yes. So I do that myself. And that was really the game changer for me is you have to track the phases in order to know how to operate properly within each phase and really leverage the benefits. I started doing that about six years ago um, when I actually started tracking my menstrual cycle and started digging in to find the research, which there is some, but few research and consolidated all together to kind of paint this picture of the female biological rhythm. And as I did that, my performance, my health, everything just got so much better. Prior to that, I was ignoring my female biology. I was operating like a man because that's what I was taught. You know, consistency is the key to success. So I was extremely consistent. I ate very well all the time, the same. I exercised all the time, the same. I took all the same supplements every day, like a million of them. I did everything that all the big biohackers tell you to do day in and day out, like clockwork. And I was totally burnt out and sick. Once I shifted that, I was able to actually start thriving and accelerating not only in my career, but in my health, in my relationships. So it really, for me, was the key to my success. Did, did you have to make some radical changes then? Because I oh, think yeah. most of us are living to this cycle because, I mean, that's the world of work, isn't it? What, what you're saying is the work. I mean, we do have to, you know, there is a nine to five and there's a five day week and it kind of goes on. So did you kind of radically make changes or did you just adjust? I radically made changes over time. So I always, the women that I work with to teach them how to track this and start to shift their lives, um, I always take, you know, bite-sized approach because if you try to overhaul your whole life in the first cycle, you're going to get overwhelmed and it's just not sustainable. So you make little changes in every cycle and you pick the things that you want to shift in each phase that are actually you know, possible to maintain. So I did this little by little, and now my phases are pretty optimized, even though I add new things in and tweak things all the time, of course, because I'm a biohacker. But, um, but I always keep into consideration, you know, when is this going to be appropriate within my biorhythm? Because not all biohacks are going to be appropriate all the time, which is why I burnt out because I was doing all the same things every day. Now, we do, we work, most of us as women, we work some kind of nine to five and we have some kind of schedule and infrastructure that is set up again around this biological rhythm of men and we have to operate in it, right? So we can take the things that we can control within our um, capacity to change them and we can start to make those shifts. And then once we do, we end up actually performing at a higher level, getting way more done in less time, not wasting our resources, not swimming up river, which I mean, you know, fighting against our biology. Um, and we end up with a lot more room to make these changes. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I think it would probably be cool just to go through some of like the starter things that you would suggest. Yeah. Because I'm sure everyone's keen to know, how do you sort of start this? I mean, even if you're tracking your cycle, you know, to, to then know how to optimize, you know, that's... Absolutely. So, of course, the first thing is to start tracking your cycle. And, you know, you can do this a manual method by journaling. You can do this using, um, there's some apps and things out there, like Clue is one that I, that I think is pretty good. Um, but again, remember that this is only tracking your menstrual cycle and your biorhythm is much bigger than that. So that's kind of step one. It's just understand where you are in your menstrual cycle. And if you don't have a period, by the way, you still have a month long biorhythm. So there are ways that you can track these physiological changes in order to determine what phase in case you don't have a period to mark, you know, phase one. Not every woman has that, but they still have all the phases. Um, so once you start to learn, you know, those shifts, then you can start to choose and place your biohacks um, within the appropriate sections, right? So one of the big things that is my biggest pet peeve, and I always cringe when the big biohackers are promoting things like the ketogenic diet or uh, fasting, intermittent fasting. 
And they suggest that we do this every day, day in and day out. And this works really, really well most of the time for the male biology because they have this 24-hour repeating system. So yes, of course, these big biohackers who happen to be men thrive when they do this and they're telling everybody, do this, do this, because they've had such great success. However, women who start following this, after a few months, they actually start to burn out. They actually start to get symptoms of hormonal dysfunction, and it's actually extremely, extremely dangerous. So that's why I want to start with these two, because they're the biggest um, issues, I would say, in the biohacking world uh, that are promoted to women without giving the right education and support for them to understand how to apply these. Women can actually use these biohacks, of course, and they are beneficial. There's autophagy and there's, you know, making that metabolic switch and all these amazing, beautiful benefits to our immune system and our metabolic health and all of these things. And that's absolutely true and wonderful. However, we can really harm our hormones and cause imbalances if we're applying them in, in times when we need to be feeding our hormones different things. So for instance, in phase one, remember, that's when we have this lowest metabolic function. Our caloric need is actually lower in phase one as well, contrary to popular belief, you know, having cravings and all that stuff. Um, that's, you know, uh, that's a sign of, of not only, you know, metabolic dysfunction, but that's a sign of um, hormonal imbalance. But because we have this lower metabolic rate and we have this lower caloric need, this is actually a great time to be doing our fasting. So phase one is really the only time that I recommend that women use a regular fasting routine, especially if they want to do a long-term fast, like 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. Do it within phase one, please. Your hormones will thank you. In phases uh, two, you really want to be increasing your fats. And so more of a ketogenic diet is actually okay through phase one and phase two, though you don't want to really carry your fasting into phase two. So you can apply something like a ketogenic diet through phases one, two, and three, essentially. But when you get to phase four, for instance, this is when, again, we're focusing, we're shifting, and we're focusing on progesterone production and support. And we're also preparing our body in the final week, in, in week four, to go back into this lower metabolic state, kind of this hibernation. So week four, we actually require a carbohydrate refeeding period. So if we want to do some kind of like low carb type of diet, we can do it, but we need to be cognizant that in, in the fourth week or, or the second half of phase four, that we really need to be feeding our body more carbohydrates. So we don't want to do a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet during that specific week. Um, another thing to, that's interesting is that the metabolism of our macros actually shifts significantly through all four phases because of the interaction of estrogen and progesterone with our metabolic function. So when we have higher progesterone, we actually have higher uh, catabolism of protein. So the way we synthesize and digest protein is heightened. So we want to give our bodies more protein during that time. And uh, during with estrogen, so during the first half, we have a heightened ability to metabolize fats. We have higher lipid oxidation um, and we have a, a heightened uh, metabolic function. So our caloric in, uh, needs shift and are a little higher as we get into the middle of our cycle. It's fascinating and it kind of makes you want to revisit all the biohacks with this kind of framework because we've talked a lot. We've, we've had people on who've done keto. We've talked about fasting we've had someone on who who did the uh, seven day water fast it was a man a healthy man and actually I had a horrible time with fasting myself I did a five day fast and it was probably one of the worst things I ever did I got so fed up afterwards it took oh. me a few months to get back back on track and and I do track my cycle but I don't at all track these four periods that you're talking about you know I just have that one reference point and really so that's so you know it's for convenience mainly you know I'm not using it as a as a bio ha hacking tool so so just puts a total different slant on all you know all of these different uh hacks I mean what about things like the cold because that's another thing 
where, you know, you see, to me, you know, you see that these great big men, you know, I was at the London biohacking, the um, health optimization summit recently, and they had these great big men sitting in these cold tubs. And I do do it. And Christine Weissel, who I think we both know, she's fabulous about yeah. doing this. But I wonder, you know, is that cyclical too? Absolutely. So what we have to understand with that specifically, and this is another one of those kind of pet peeve things where, and they, they're they not meaning any harm by suggesting that everybody should do cold thermogenesis every day because it works well for the men. And they're like, this is great. Everyone should do it. Um, I agree. Everyone should use this tool, but apply it in the appropriate time. And Kristen actually takes this into account with her female clients. So I love the work that she does on this. Um, but essentially what you want to be aware of is how the nervous system operates through the four phases and how our uh, stress capacity shifts. So in the front half of our phase, as estrogen rises, our stress capacity actually heightens. So we have more of a parasympathetic quality to the nervous system. In the back half, we get more of a sympathetic quality to the nervous system. And we can even see this because there are physiological shifts like our respiration rate increases, our um, heart rate increases, and different, different things happen that show us that our nervous system is kind of ramped up. So what that means is, you know, if you think of, of, of our capacity for stress as a bucket and how much stress can we all endure? It, our buckets are different sizes depending on the person. Probably biohackers have bigger buckets because they're doing a lot more things to increase the size of their capacity. But for women, no matter how big or small your bucket is, what you have to understand is in the front half of your cycle, it gets bigger. In the back half, it gets smaller. So when your nervous system has more of a sympathetic quality and your stress bucket shrinks, even if you're putting things in that are positive forms of stress, like cold thermogenesis, they still go into the bucket. It's the same bucket, whether there's positive or negative stress going in. Once that bucket overflows, that's when you experience the symptoms of burnout. So for me personally, I use cold thermogenesis when, first of all, my nervous system is in really good shape, meaning I've really been taking care of myself well, and I have a bigger bucket to begin with. And secondly, when I'm in that follicular and ovulatory phases of my cycle, that's when I apply this specific biohack because my nervous system can handle it. It does put a totally different slant on it. It kind of also helps to understand how sometimes these things do seem a lot harder than others, you know? Yeah. For a lot of things, you know, even the diet, you know, the crate, what you're trying to eat. And it's very fascinating too about, you know, when to eat fat and when to eat carbs, because again, that's something with all the diet protocols, it normally is a blanket. Okay. Yeah. For a few months, usually try to do this diet, you know, and that's something that we last for the last season, Russ and I were doing challenges and we've done the keto challenge. We've so, so it does put a very different slant in it. I mean, are you designing like a kind of program where people can sort of you almost need it where people can put in their their cycle and then it helps to guide you of what might be best to do? Yes. So I actually have a program for women. Um, it's all online, all on demand. And it basically, it teaches the woman about these four phases. It teaches you how to track. It also teaches you where you are in the life cycle, what your biorhythm looks like in that different phase of your life cycle, and then how to navigate it. So I teach women about their biochemistry, about their physiology, about their neurology, about their psychology, how all these things shift through all the four phases. And then we go deeply into each topic about how to shift, you know, their biohacking routine, their self-care routine, all of these things, including their nutrition, their fitness, their sleep, their stress management. Um, and each one has its own dedicated section that we go through the four phases to really understand. So, you know, we talked a little bit about nutrition, which we scratched the surface because we talked about the macros. Um, but there's even different micronutrients that we need during each of the phases. And so to understand that, I teach the biochemistry that goes into it. 
and how we need to really support our bodies properly through each of each of the phases. So it's a lot of education up front, but once you know it, then it's easy. Then you're, you know, you're looking at your supplements. You're like, oh yeah, this one's good for this phase. This one's not. You're looking at your food and you're saying, this is going to be a good way to eat right now. And then later on, I'm going to eat in this different way, or this exercise is going to be really good right now. And then later on, I'm going to avoid that for a week because it's really not going to be supportive of me. Um, and things like that. And then of course, all your biohacks, your fasting, your cold thermogenesis and all of that. Are there markers or like measurements that you can see that, uh, that help you understand that you're, you're going into that next phase outside of some of the obvious things, but are there markers to let you know, so you can trigger that? Is it, and, and it's not just physiological, but are there like blood markers or things that you're tracking to see that? Well, with, if you're looking at, um, like lab testing, the gold standard would be to test your hormones every day. They haven't come out with a way to do that at home in an easy way. It's very difficult to do it. And then, you know, there's the issue of, of saliva versus urine. There's a lot of things that go into it. Anyway, so that's not really feasible for 99.9% .9 of women. Um, that would be the gold standard. And what I actually teach is I teach women how they can use these physiological shifts to look at their um, their health, their performance, to look at their energy levels, their mood, to look at different psychological aspects and physiological measurements, if they use like wearables, for instance, um, so that they can learn the different shifts. But it all starts with this basic education about the physiology of the four um, phases. So then they understand what they're tracking and how it shifts. So I spend a whole week on that topic with, with the women in my program, and then they learn how to do this for themselves. And of course you can use, you know, your technologies and everything as well, but I do recommend doing more of a journaling method at first so that you can raise your self-awareness about your body and how it operates so that later on you don't have to do that you'll already be in tune to what's going on because you're paying attention now yeah it's that awareness 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 it kind of always does come back to that having an awareness of your body and what's going on you know a lot of these tools we've we've just spoke to someone who's got a great tool for helping with mental performance but a lot of it comes down to using these tools to help you integrate your own self-awareness because like you were saying you know probably the thing about the keto diet it, if you were really tuned into yourself you your body would know what you want to eat it's just we've kind of detached ourselves from that inner knowing and we go you know we you know whatever we're reading the latest book and we're kind of taking that advice rather than kind of really deciding what do I actually feel like eating have I got the nutrients that the nutrition filled foods available that I can just self select, but I, I can totally see where you're, where it's, where it's coming from. And really, it needs well for a start. It needs a lot more research to be done on women, by the sound of it, because if all the research that we're basing a lot of this stuff on is still mainly male orientated, we don't actually know. Like, so, I mean, I my as I'm always banging on about red light or even any kind of phototherapy, the the data just isn't there. Right. to know either way at the moment. Yeah, and you you won't find any kind of study that's looking at red light impact on women only, <laughs> which would be something that, first of all, you know, the issue is that when you study women, you need to study them through all four phases. Most studies are not taking place through multiple cycles. To get the proper findings that actually have statistical significance, you have to go through at least three cycles and be measuring a large enough population of women to be appropriate to represent the population of women, which is half the population, right? So there's a lot of issues, um, but there is a lot of research out there if folks are interested if you go on PubMed or something like this, uh, you know, wherever you get your scientific journals, you can actually search menstrual cycle impact on XYZ, right? And you'll find a handful of articles. And um, what I've done is I've actually, over the past six years, I've, I've collected every published article on this topic. Um, and I have, you know, hundreds of keywords that I use to look through this. But if you want to try to get a sense for this and start to kind of dive into the science, just search menstrual cycle impact and then see what you find. And you'll probably find some really interesting studies. And there's a lot more coming out more recently, which is exciting. Yeah. 
and presumably you're doing education for men as well because I know we've talked mainly about women but you know if you're a personal trainer or if you know if you're doing this this is kind of crucial well even if you're just a man wanting to understand what's going on even maybe yeah absolutely this is a big part of what I'm doing I'm looking at Russ um, with these three girls <laughs> like, yeah. I need to know this yeah. three daughters and yeah yeah but there's there there is something here though that I think there's a danger of what you're saying which is uh you know, my wife and I, we will diet at the same time and do similar diets. We eat our dinners together. We eat similar things together. Like it is important to separate a bit uh, and and treat that differently. And I also think like one of the things that keeps ringing through my head as you're as you're saying all these things and really it's really enlightening is the danger of having a male general practitioner doctor that um, a male who doesn't who's kind of prescribing the same things to both to all of their patients versus going in and, and treating their patients a bit differently. I'd imagine that it isn't it. it I don't know. Is it good? Is, a woman should have a female doctor. Well, I mean, they understand each here's other the better, thing. Right? Like, it doesn't matter if your doctor is male or female because zero doctors are given the proper education about feminine biology. This true. is something that I am very passionate about working to change and bring this education into the mainstream educational systems. So whether you have a doctor who's a man or a woman, they absolutely need to be considering your biorhythm when they're prescribing things or when they're offering lifestyle medicine or whatever it is that they're doing any kind of treatment. Um, there was actually a really interesting study that just came out of UC Berkeley that highlighted this very issue that you're talking about which actually showed that because the clinical research that is done on male bodies, primarily on male bodies, determines the dosages of medications. And as a result, women are sustaining higher rates of injury and even death. And so women are kind of paying the price for this gap in the health science research. Um, which is ridiculous and really, really harmful. It's actually a problem that is well known and talked about within the scientific community, but it's not really mainstream. But this is something that we need to talk about, especially when we're talking about treatments that could cause injury or death with giving the wrong dosage because we're not understanding women's bodies. Yeah, you know, I was on our last podcast, Sarah and I were talking to someone about professional athletes or just like athletes in general. Uh, and I've noticed with my daughter, who's a basketball player, uh, a much higher incidence, uh, especially at these older ages in their 20s, where they have knee injuries, right? And and a lot of the protocol and training that they do are male-driven protocols uh, for how they do their pivoting and dribbling. And, and, and I, I imagine that's why there are so many. Like, they're not being cognizant of the fact that, like, a woman is developed much differently physically and they should not be doing the similar, the same exercises. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. There's actually the most research that is done in this area, looking at the hormonal impact on performance is done in sports performance. So you'll find a whole lot of studies in that area. Um, actually a book that I read many, many years ago, like 10 years ago when I was working in physical therapy in undergrad, um, I read this book called Warrior Girls. Great book. You should pick it up. I think it would be really insightful for your for your daughters and especially their athletic performance. Um, but it talked about this very problem and how women are sustaining injury at a way higher rate and how they need to be operating differently in their sport, but they're held to the same standard as their male counterpart which we can hold them to the same performance standard only if we're supporting them to perform at their highest level, meaning that we have to be flexible with their biological shifts. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I imagine that's the same thing as working out. Like your workout regimen should be different in each cycle. You shouldn't do morning workouts or do afternoon workouts. Right. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah, it is. And, and like you say, until we start to get the data and then, like you say, with all the difficulties of collecting that data, it's going to take a while to accumulate that. In the meantime, it is about, like you say, trying to take personal responsibility, get this awareness. What would you say then would, would make the biggest impact for like women listening who kind of want to take on this information but don't know where to start? What would be the first thing, apart from, like you say, journaling, once you've got that piece down? The first piece is tracking, like you mentioned, and however you do your tracking, whether you use some kind of app or you're just kind of intuitively paying attention, whatever you do, you've got to understand that. And then 
to start to pay attention to these physiological shifts and learn about that, you know, I have um, I have a, a free resource that I think could be helpful to the women listening um, that I can offer to you, which is a little ebook that I created that kind of goes over some of this. But once we start to gain awareness of these shifts in our body, then we need to take a evaluation of our lifestyle and say, you know, where am I uh, operating consistently? Because you can be sure that wherever that is, it's not helping you to perform at your highest level all the time. So we we don't want consistency as women, actually. You know, it's it goes against what we've been taught our whole lives, which is consistency is the key to success. Well, for women, it is the killer of success because it may, whatever we're being consistent with, may match up with us sometimes and then the other half of the time it doesn't and it actually wears us down so the first thing that i ask for women um from men and women is i want everyone to give permission to operate differently and then i want the second step of this is to offer flexibility to ourselves and to the other women in our lives so that we actually can do things differently. So permission and flexibility. And those are the starting points. And then it's all about self-awareness and shifting. And I do say um, biohacking is more important for women than men because we can't rely on the scientific research and we can't rely on all of these amazing um, suggestions that are out there in the biohacking space because they just don't apply to us. So we do have to take an N equals one approach to our health as women. So add that into your permission to yourself. You can do things differently. And if you feel like it's not working for you, it's probably not. Remember, a woman's intuition is a real thing. We can actually measure this with brain scans now. And so we can actually utilize that, right? Yeah. Especially in phase four. <laughs> Especially in phase four, where you have the heightened EQ. I, I heard that. <laughs> you take I, I would trust. say the number one thing. <laughs> oh, of course. I, I, my, my world is surrounded by amazing females. I am just here to lift heavy things. <laughs> Um, and even I think my one daughter could lift heavier things than me, but, but I think that there's, uh, there's something that even comes before that, which is like, you know, permission. Yes. But awareness, awareness. like as a, as a man, as a, as a father, as someone who works with, with many amazing women, I think it's understanding that the tactic of like, we're going to grind this out for four weeks straight and we're going to all like, no, like there has to be an understanding that like. You know, build in cushions to your schedule, have some flexibility with yourself and understand that that the females in your life need to do things a bit differently. And and I think like dieting and, you know, it's great that you and your partner can do things together, but like give it a break. Let them go do their own thing. Like they need to eat differently. They need to exercise differently. And you can come together in recovery and drink your water and your your green juice. Absolutely. Together. Yeah. Well said, Ross. <laughs> yeah, I totally applaud that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's super cool. It's super cool. And it's a totally different perspective. And I think it's something that's becoming more and more important as as people do start to take control of their health. And, you know, we are starting to get more digital things are on apps, you know, to have that awareness and to, to have that understanding, you know, will go such a long way. So thank you so much for doing all this excellent research. We'll definitely put your little booklet on our um website and in our podcast notes awesome. it, maybe you just want to mention where where women can find you in case they want to look you up that would yeah. be cool yeah um if you want to connect with me and i provide a lot of um free information about women's health and um biohacking and neuropsychophysiology and all the things that i study um my social media handle is biocurious underscore kayla so you can find me that way. Um, and then if you want to dive deeper into your biological rhythm and start to learn more about this, you can visit herbiorhythm.com. Excellent. Yes. That's super cool. Thank you so much Beautiful. for coming on, Kayla. I mean, I'm actually going to yeah. message you after the show because I have got lots of things that were going through my mind, like with a couple of studies that I'm doing on light. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder. So thank you so much for just such a stimulating conversation. Um, thank you. It's very thank cool. You for having it's me very on. cool to have you on. Yeah. Breaking the crack.